Yeah, it was really delightful this morning. I'm not a morning person. I'm the owl rather than the lark, and it was still very worth getting up for me getting up at five o'clock to help make it happen. And just as you hear the dogs in the morning and the people came out, just hands up the people who went out this morning. I know there was quite yeah. Very good, all very well behaved, didn't feed the dogs or anything, we had four people right. In fact, somebody enjoyed it so much they hung on to the tabard that they were wearing, so if we could have that back at the end, that would be really, <laughs> that would be really you know, it's like taking the towels, isn't it? When it's a dog event, you just take the high vis. Uh, but yeah, it was good, and I think that the key thing that uh, Caroline alluded to yesterday in terms of how using all train vehicles to actually control the dogs, support them, but also the opportunity gives you that if you need to stop quickly, like when we changed over from one rider to another, it gives you so much control, and I know that was quite um, enlightening for some of the people in the audience. So thank you for getting up with me and, and enjoying all that. So, commercial dog walking. Uh, I was asked to do a session, there we go, uh, just on this, because again, this is something 10 years ago, we really weren't discussing, or even in, with the Forestry Commission, we would talk about the more walking of multiple dogs rather than commercial dog walking, and I make the point that Commercial dog walking is doing it just for money. Professional dog walking implies a certain amount of standards and professionalism. So I just wanted to run you through a few bits because people wanted to know a little bit more about what, what was going on. And to put it out there, you know, some of the things that people do say about it to start with, I get this often from land managers and people saying, commercial dog, why get a dog and then pay somebody else to walk it? Duh. And you'll hear that, and some of you may well have those views, and that's fine, I understand that, and it, and it is a perception that's out there. But even from the dog-owning community, you get people who use dog walkers are just lazy. They don't love my dog as much as I do. We heard yesterday all this blame the dog and guilt that dog walkers can be quite good at pushing out onto each other. So, you know, so why do we really need commercial dog walkers at all? Because I think it's a fair question to ask, and asking that helps you understand what's going on a wee bit more as well. And these will be things that I'm sure some of you, you know, in your day-to-day -day work will be coming up with either from yourself or things that um, in your inboxes or people are making comments and complaints about. About commercial dog walkers repeatedly using the same areas, lack of control, particularly in car parks. We heard yesterday that, you know, some people are really getting dogs out of vans under control. Some you'll have seen just open the doors, the dogs haven't been safely transported and they'll just whiz out. And that's a problem for the dog owners, let alone other people visiting sites. Increased fouling of land, people will say, impacts on other visitors. And the commercial pressure is told, let's get them through and walk them and get them exercised and get away, can make you potentially more likely to behave irresponsibly. Increased land management costs, um, and also the whole thing about, as ever, some of these operators are really, really good, and some are cowboys who just think, this is a really good way to make some money. And that's, again, it's a bit like yesterday, how do we promote the good and minimize the bad? And I talk about perceptions here because there isn't a great deal of evidence that, for example, we are getting increased fouling of land. It's a bit like, you know, we talked about the sheep worrying thing yesterday. Sheep have been attacked, I saw some dog walkers, so that means it was the dog walkers, when actually we know we've got some better evidence, it isn't as straightforward as that. But often perception is reality, so we need to, to work with these things. So look at the other side of the coin then. There, is, there are positives there, that's why they can make money in essence. Because commercial dog walkers allow people to enjoy the benefits of dog ownership, and we'll hear some more about that from, from Carrie very soon, for lots of really legitimate reasons. For example, they can't take their dogs to work, unlike at the Kennel Club, this is one of the, the office dogs, Buddy, working in the, the library, very good. Um, and yeah, if you come and visit us, you, you'll see that happening in, in the office, and great to see that the Forestry Commission has a fair few dogs in their offices as well, and a good dog policy. But the person might also have a really a permanent disability, uh, and actually that dog, as we heard last night, actually can be really good in terms of them thinking about wanting to get up in the morning and to take exercise, but maybe they can't walk their dog as much as they need to. And actually doing the right thing, let's get somebody else to walk it, is a really positive intention. Um, somebody might also have a temporary impairment, they might have broken their leg or something, and what's the better thing to do, get somebody to walk your dog or just stay at home and let the dog be frustrated and you know, maybe cause more problems. So people doing it are actually trying to do the right thing, better than the people who leave their dogs locked in a house for eight or ten hours a day. The personal circumstances may have changed, for example, divorce. You know, when you're thinking about the relationships people have with their dogs, they might be happy for their partner to go eventually, but, oh my goodness, I'm hanging on to my dog at a time like this, but it needs its exercise. So again, positive reasons. And also the practicalities that actually, if they can't look after the dog properly, they might either choose to rehome it, 
or it might be dumped if they're irresponsible, or they might choose to euthanize that pet. So actually, there is a market there. So how do we promote the good about commercial dog walking, but actually minimize the negative impacts as well? So one of the things I did in terms of the work I've been doing went to look in North America because, as, as Terry was saying, you know, that some of these things are much more advanced. And in Canada, as with public access, commercial dog walking is much more restricted. And this is very similar in, in, in America as well and in Australia. So, for example, where, apart from the fact that they're very limited where they can go, as people are in general in North America, um, they have to wear a tabard with an index number on it, and every dog that's being walked by them has to have a tag on it, so District of West Vancouver, and that's the commercial dog walker's number. So there's a lot of control there, but there's also things, culturally things are very different, societies are much more like regulated, and many more limited places is where you can go. Innovatively as well, some of the firms are using GPS trackers on the dogs so that um, people can then, when they're at work on their, their phone, see where their dog is. Although I'm sure lots of you can see that, well, you could have one dog with half a dozen of these things and it looks like they're, they're being walked. But again, it shows that people are interested in their dogs. Um, in, uh, again, another commercial dog walker, this is just outside Vancouver. There they can go to night school classes to learn about how to run a dog walking business. Um, and Jill Taggart, who some of, some of the people in here will know, runs those courses, working really well. And it's being sold as a really positive thing, because they want customers to think, actually, I'm being the most responsible person to be trusted with your pet. So there's lots of good practice. And there's still bad practice. Like this commercial dog walker that went to jail for six months for leaving the dogs in the car, and the sixth dog died of heat stroke while she was in the shopping mall. So this is something also to think about, that if you're actually thinking about how you're going to regulate commercial dog walking or get involved, that you need to have systems in place so if somebody says, well, actually, you regulated or you gave this person a license, so there are potential downsides, but there are also very much welfare considerations as well that we need to be aware of. And this was a really tragic case, because initially this lady said, oh, my van was stolen, and she was there with the wanted posters on TV, and they found their six dogs dead in a ditch and it was only through CCTV that actually found out it was her and that can happen so we need to be aware that you know there's, there's lots of things going on there but also managing commercial dog walking well can be really good for dog welfare so irrespective of the access stuff there's again a really good join up between the welfare organizations and land, land and access managers like yourselves one of the things we did with the, the Kennel Club was to do a survey because there was concerns about this back in 2016 and I know some of you will have responded to this. We did a survey to our land managers and also to dog walkers and dog owners and got lots of really useful data. This was just looking at the dog walkers and dog owners at 2,500 responses, which is really good. And we just asked, would these, how many people think these things would be essential if somebody's walking your dog for money? So he said, public liability insurance, how, you know, how many people think that should be essential? 84% sounds really good, but that means 16% of people taking other people's dogs out on site, not insured. Potential for a dog to cause a road traffic incident, or that's you know, just worrying. Um, there are issues in the dog world about whether people should vaccinate their dogs or not, but if you've got lots of dogs being put into a van together, the potential for, for infection, so it's quite high. 38% thought that only walking vaccinated dogs should be essential. 58% thought that canine first aid should be essential. I mean, just why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? Um, so again, these are things that are quite room because I think, oh, they're nice, they'll just walk my dog. But it, as a business, it's very, very, a very, very different kettle of fish. 86% um, of people said, and these are dog owners and dog walkers, saying, oh yeah, uh, you should get permission for a dog to be exercised off lead. But 14% would take somebody else's dog and then let it off lead without getting permission of the owner. I just find that really scary. Just as if I was doing it as a business, it's like, gee, that dog off lead then causes a problem and the owner says, I'll never give you permission to do that. It's terrible on lead, didn't you ask? Crazy. Uh, and even just having the details of emergency vets in your phone, which is like pretty easy to do. 70%, yeah. So most people were, were saying the right stuff, but there's, you know, there are concerns that some people are just taking it in a far too relaxed kind of way. So again, like yesterday, the, the key approach for both myself and for the Kennel Club is how do we promote the good things about commercial dog walking, which we've heard of, but also reduce the negative impacts, again, to have healthy, happy, hassle-free commercial dog walks, again, for both the dogs, the clients, and other people who are using the sites as well. Now, some work that was done um, about 14 years ago between the Kennel Club 
countryside agency as it was and uh, Hampshire County Council was finding out what most influenced uh, dog owners and we found that again as I was saying yesterday it's other dog owners and canine professionals so the twist on this is actually why don't we make commercial dog walkers part of the solution because they're dealing with a lot of the people that we actually want to influence so actually if we can get them to know the right messages about picking up and lead use and livestock then you know can they put those things out to their clients so some work that uh, again I did with Scottish Natural Heritage we run around six commercial dog walker workshops at various sites across Scotland supported by the Kennel Club because there's a lot of suspicion if you're, you're a public body and say oh come along dog, you know, dog walkers we want to talk to you because traditionally there have been things like come along to this event and we'll give you 10 reasons why you're really bad for birds or you're the, these are the pets of Satan or whatever they may be. Um, so we actually put a dog treat in the envelope as well to get the dogs interested. And it was just meant to how, how you being a really responsible commercial dog walker can be good for business. We didn't say and for wildlife and other people, but let's, you know, let's appeal to their, their best intent, to their own intentions. Um, and as part of that, we did um, surveys before and after the events. And again, this is data that I haven't really seen anywhere else. This is from 79 survey respondents. And this is in a report, which again, I can share with you, but it's out on the web as well on the SNH website. Average commercial dog walk, round an hour. Maximum dogs per walk, on average, 5.2, but that could go as high as 10 and go as low as 2. Most using a van, around 20 minutes drive to, to where they would walk the dogs. Very similar to, to general dog walkers, if you like. Um, some employ people, that sort of thing. But again, useful to, for getting an idea of where they go, what they do. And we asked them where they like to go. Um, most clients, again, wanted their dogs to be exercised off lead. Um, parks, seashore, moorland. People generally tried to uh, avoid conflict with livestock. An interesting one for you, just following on from the last presentation, 58% said that they would pay to go to places other people would. If they got the choice to say, actually, we'll rent you this field, maybe it's deer fenced or something and you can use that, they would pay to do that because it works for them and their business as well. And I know places where that's, that's happening. And that solves a land management problem and also brings some income for the site as well. So something to think about. Dog walkers saying fewer places to go, and again, they were really honest. Most people, if you ask them whether they pick up who they always do, and at least in this survey, they were good in actually saying, they're in woodland and moorland, we tend not to. So again, some issues about education there, but great, they were being honest. And this is actually a field that was used for grazing ponies, and now it's being used by commercial dog walkers, and they've kind of beautified a bit. It's, um, it's like an urban fringe site. Um, but yeah, so they use it, manage the site, and, and it works well. So the, the events that happened, again this was just to try and see can we get commercial dog walkers on side. Had these events in an evening and there was a vet talking and they talked about green dog walkers which we mentioned a little bit yesterday. And there was stuff about um, the Scottish Outdoor Access Code, in essence in England and Wales we call that the countryside code, accreditation and a local vet speaking and getting a workshop type format. And one of the things they got um, was mentioned was one of the most successful schemes for, for managing commercial dog walking that East Lothian Council run, so sort of near Edinburgh for those of you not as familiar with the area. And there is a voluntary scheme, but what they do is that they have rules that commercial dog walkers agree to sign up to, and the upside for them is they get listed on the council's website, and the commercial dog walkers have found that that is so valuable to them because you put in dog walking Livingstone or Edinburgh or Penny Cook or something like that. And because of the way that Google and other search engines work, if you're listed on the council's website, you come up first. Uh, and they've kicked some people off this scheme um, when there, were, there was a case where there were some um, people not picking up. And they were pleading to go back into the voluntary scheme because it hit their business. So this is where commercial dog walkers are significantly different to normal dog walkers, that you can work with that business imperative. The business imperative can be a burden, but also you can turn it around to a benefit. And that's one of the, the best schemes that, that's out there, and people are trying to replicate that now, because legally it is, it is difficult to do it to say you, you must have a, a permit. After the event, there were some surveys done of the participants, uh, the clients were more able to advise clients on responsible dog walking because they've been exposed to the Scottish Outdoor Access Code. 84% really wanted accreditation because they wanted to be better than the bad folk. And, and there's a lot of naivety in terms of dog owners as well, in terms of you know, what they should be asking for from their dog walkers. Um, so basically lots of positive stuff if we engage with them. So then where are we now in 2019? And again, there's 
it's good for you to read those reports, but I wanted to give you some, some takeaways, if you like, although that's making me feel hungry. Um, so let's look at 2019. There are some key access issues here with my, my access hat on. For example, in Scotland, under the Land Reform Act 2003, which gives this general right of access, uh, responsible access to most of the land in Scotland, commercial activities, if they're pretty much the same as what people do anyway, so like if you were a walking guide, that sort of thing, they're included in access rights. But in England and Wales, they're not included in access land. And so, in many cases, unless the commercial dog walkers are sticking to public rights of way, in theory, it's often trespass, because often places like um, Forestry Commission, Crown Estate have something in their bylaws about commercial activities without permission. Uh, and even in parks and gardens and stuff, there's often things, rules like that, because they want to control trading and stuff. But actually, what do you do with that? Are you going to go, you know, how often do people actually use bylaws? You know, and there's lots of people out here. Anybody actually use bylaws to, to enforce anything? Oh, wow, we should have a special, and, and was it, did it solve the problem? Uh, sometimes. Yeah, but it can take a lot of time as well, yeah. Um, but again, commercial dog walkers, we know that that whole thing about helping them do the right thing is out there. So legal options for enforcement are often limited, but it can be done. But also we're seeing the problem that uh, in some areas in England and Wales, we're getting um, councils saying, all right, the way to deal with this is to have a, a maximum number of dogs, public spaces, protection orders, and often they'll be going for over six or four. But the whole displacement issue is just like, whew, you know, so that over their head, they're not bothered. So again, there's key issues of, in more urban areas, dog walk has been, uh, moved out by a maximum number of dogs public spaces protection order and moving into actually more rural sites or sites that are designated under the birds and habitats directives. In London, because there's some slightly different uh, laws around there, there are some licensing schemes, the Royal Parks have one and so does Wandsworth. They set a maximum of between four and eight dogs. In Wandsworth the license is free but it just limits where you can actually go. Um, and in the Royal Parks it's £300 plus fat. But again, for somebody doing commercial dog walking in London, that's, that's really not particularly an issue. The trouble is, the problem with the Royal Parks have got is that then the people that they've licensed, they're saying, you should be taking action against the unlicensed people. So it actually has just created different problems, um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do anything. 2019, only a few weeks ago, this code for professional dog walking came out, and this was produced by the Pet Industries Federation, and we've got a lot of high hopes because you know, I talked about that research the Kennel Club did in 2016. We, we were, the Kennel Club was planning to bring out its own guidelines. And then this came along, it's like, oh, do we really want two different sets of guidelines? We all talked about, you know, clarity and consistency. And these are people who are going on and doing it. So the Kennel Club kind of put its work on hold. And so these guidelines are out there now. Um, very, very good on issues about welfare and health and how you travel dogs safely in vans and that, because it's come from the sort of doggy people side, um, endorsed by Dogs Trust and RSPCA. Um, so there's really good on that. I have to say I'm disappointed in terms of the access content. Some of it isn't particularly accurate, uh, some of the legislation's out of date, and there's, there's also stuff in there um, that, you know, you know, we were talking yesterday about the need to raise awareness about uh, neosporosis and picking up um, in areas where cattle are grazing, uh, not in there. And it's disappointing because without being too political, but the offers were there, you can tell that I and other people have a passing interest in these issues and would have been really happy to input. But there can be a version too. But to me, the key thing, yes, we, there's lots about the dog, but walking and land access is fundamental to commercial dog walking, and it's a shame to not see that uh, as well in there. Uh, and one of these things, you know, I was saying yesterday that it's actually working across sectors that there's a key need for, for land management in, input into that and it's something that hopefully will, will come in due course. But it may be that the Kennel Club produces some additional guidelines just dealing with the land access issues and that's something that we're talking with the Forestry Commission about. There's also to me some issues about it in terms of what's going to happen. In the past we just said sometimes these things are going to sit on a shelf, now they sit on the cloud, don't they, or something, and it's great, but what's going to happen to it? Because to me a real opportunity with this is actually saying to the, the dog owners themselves, these are the things you should be asking for when you're trusting your pet to somebody else. Um, so how is it going to be used? And also within here, 
um, there, there's inconsistencies because on one hand they're recommending walking no more than four dogs and there are issues with the number because actually two dogs really badly behaved and running about off lead can be worse than you know five two hours on a lead you know it's not very outcome oriented but they picked a number but then the ones with scheme uh, the local authority scheme allows you to have up to eight dogs so you can be doing everything that the local council wants but if somebody says, are you complying with these guidelines? They say no, because you're actually walking more than four. So again, are the commercial dog walkers going to buy into this? Not entirely sure. Very new, I would hope so. And it's certainly, you know, I was saying yesterday about incrementally making things better. This certainly can help. It's England and Wales only. And so I'd say it's a really good starting point for local codes of practice. So if you are thinking of doing something, uh, whether you're thinking of running at an event or something like that, there, there is really good stuff in there but I would say it is a, a bit weak on the land access side at the moment. So that's fine, but what can you do? Here are some of my top tips, if you like. Um, many of these are not actually that different to what we would look at for normal dog walkers. And in fact, if they'd included the dog walking code uh, in this one, and just said, you know, follow the, the Natural England and Natural Resources Wales dog walking code, you know, that would have been a, a huge help, because there's lots of stuff in there which is exactly the same. Um, but clear local positive guidance, because sometimes these people just won't know they're causing a problem. And this whole thing again about having a dialogue with them can really help them pass these things on to their clients. And, because, and they'll probably listen more to their, their dog walker than they will to a ranger. Thinking about the canine welfare issues, being very well aware that if you as a body are putting your stamp on saying this is good commercial dog walking, and some dogs die or get killed, there's the potential in the Twitter sphere for you to be brought in on that. So if you want some advice on dog welfare issues and whatever, come to the Kennel Club and we're happy to suggest what you know, should be in there. Support the responsible commercial dog walkers. We've got Dawn talking a little bit later, and this is uh, an event that dog, uh, Dawn was doing, again, reflecting the work that was done in Scotland, but how do we engage with these people to become our advocates? And I'll take any more away from Dawn with that, but that's stuff that you can do. Um, and again, you know, that 58% of commercial dog walkers would pay to, you know, rent land to walk dogs in. And actually that can be a real win-win, if you'll excuse the jargon for everybody, if you think about it. And I know quite a few farmers and land managers now are getting more money from commercial dog walking than actually pony paddocks and, and that sort of thing, because there's more money there. And it also means that it's like, if there's any pool left in there, I'm going to rent it to somebody else. And it gives them a commercial advantage. Raising awareness with dog owners too, you know, there's a lot of naivety out there in terms of, you know, they assume that the dog walker loves their dog as much as they do. Some do, some are brilliant. Some, it's just a way of making money. You may not be able to control the dog walking, but actually where you're using car parks, you can control where they park, which can influence where they go and what they do. And discuss things with your local dog wardens, because they've got different powers as too, which can be really helpful. Again, if your council's nearby looking to introduce something like a maximum number of dogs, look out for those displacement issues and speak to them about it. And as I say, come to the, the Kennel Club for advice. Happy to share those statistics with you. And hopefully, we will get better. Um, but I think there's still a way to go. But as ever, there's the national guidelines, but there's also what does it mean at a local level and the opportunity to engage with commercial dog walkers on your sites and actually help promote the good, help them seem to be more responsible businesses and make them part of the solution and not just the problem, as a principle, is, is the way to go. Thank you.